The Fundamentals of Defectology, Abnormal Psychology, and Learning Disabilities by Lev Vygotsky. This is Chapter 2, Principles of Education for Physically Handicapped Children. 1. The revolution which redesigned our schools from top to bottom barely affected the special schools for handicapped children. In schools for blind, deaf, mute, and, and mentally challenged children, everything stands now precisely as it did before the revolution, if one does not take into account a few unessential mechanical changes. Thus, work remains even now unrelated in theory and in practice to general principles of social education and to our republic's system of public education. The problem is that in order to connect abnormal child education, education for the deaf, the blind, the mentally handicapped, and so forth, with the general principles and methods of social education, we must find a system which would successfully coordinate special education with normal education. Before us stands the enormous creative task of rebuilding our schools on new principles. We must project basic policies for such an undertaking. In other words, start from the beginning. Given all of its merits, our special school is noted for one basic shortcoming. Be they blind, deaf, mute, or mentally handicapped children, the special school locks its pupils into the narrow school of, of this, into the narrow circle of the school collective. It creates a small, separated, and secluded world. Everything is adjusted and adapted to the child's defect. Everything focuses attention on the physical handicap of the child, and does not introduce the child to real life. Instead of helping children escape from their isolated worlds, our special school usually develops in them tendencies which direct them toward greater and greater isolation and which enhance their separatism. Because of these shortcomings, not only does the overall upbringing of the child become paralyzed, but even special education sometimes amounts to almost not. Take, for example, the speech of a deaf mute child. In spite of excellent instruction in oral speech, the speech of a deaf child remains in embryo because the secluded world in which he lives does not create a need for it. Such a secluded system of education for the blind, deaf, mute, and mentally handicapped came from us, from Germany, where it flourished and was developed to its logical limits. Therefore, at first glance, it served as a tempting example. If you read the description of German special schools, you will see that they represent far from ordinary schools. They grew into a series of very complex institutions, which have as their final goal the expansion and advancement of certain special devices for blind and deaf mute children, to which they have become accustomed in school and which they cannot do without. The number of institutions often exceeds several dozen. If you pursue this, you will learn that some well-endowed schools even own small banks in order to open up credit for the blind and deaf mute for the purpose of trading and trade activity in their future lives. All such institutions serve the same goal, social charity. In this way, a certain type of fortress is created, solidly conquering for itself a corner of the outside world, and nevertheless bequeathing a certain position on the defective child even after leaving school. In Germany, even a university education for the blind has until now worn a certain distinction for its special system. The well-known Marburg University includes courses for the blind, which hos hospitably invite blind citizens from the USSR to come to receive a higher education. It is assumed that those blind persons who wish to specialize in an area of higher education should be separated from the general mass of the student population and placed under special conditions. Precisely because of this, on the one hand, Germany claims to have only an, ins an insignificant number of defective children. And on the other hand, thanks to the fact that Germany has established maximum isolation of these institutions, many share an opinion about the strength and merit of the German system. This system differs radically from our pedagogical practice. In our country, instruction and education of the blind and other handicapped children must be seen as a problem of social education, 
both psychologically and educationally, this is a question of social education. In fact, it is exceedingly easy to notice that each physical handicap, be it blindness, deafness, or mental handicap, causes, as it were, a social aberration. As soon as this defect is noted, a blind child from the first days of his birth acquires some special position even in his own family. His relations with the surrounding world begin to take a different course from that of a normal child. One can see that blindness and deafness mean not only a breach of the child's activity with respect to the physical world, but most importantly, a rupture of all systems which determine all functions of the child's social behavior. That this is actually so will become absolutely clear, it seems, if we fully explain this point of view. It is self-explanatory that blindness and deafness are biological factors, and in no way social. The fact of the matter is that education must cope not so much with these biological factors as with their social consequences. When we have before us a blind child as a subject for education, then we have to deal not so much with blindness by itself as with those conflicts which face the blind child on his entrance into the world. At that time, all the systems which determine the child's social behavior are disrupted. And therefore, it seems to me from a pedagogical point of view, the education of such a child amounts to rectifying completely these social ruptures. It is as if we have before us a physically disjointed hand. We have to set the affected organ. The main goal is to correct the break in social interaction by using some other path. I shall not go into a specific analysis of the psychological conception of deaf muteness or blindness. I permit myself to dwell only on those generally accepted notions which can usually be found in literature. Blindness or deafness as psychological factors do not exist for the blind or deaf person himself. We are wrong to imagine that a blind person is submerged in darkness, that he feels as though, he's, as though he has fallen into a dark pit. Corroborated both by objective analysis and the subjective impressions of the deaf him, themselves, sufficiently authoritative research has testified to the fact that such a conception is absolutely false. The blind do not directly sense their blindness, just as the deaf do not feel that they live in an oppressive silence. I would like to point out only that for the educator, as for any person dealing with a blind child, in hopes of educating him, blindness exists not so much as a direct physiological factor, but as a result of the social consequences of blindness with which he must cope. In scientific literature and in public opinion, a false conception has taken firm hold about the nature of the biological compensation for a defect. It is believed that nature, in depriving us of one of the senses, seems to compensate by an extraordinary development of the remaining sense. That is, that the blind have an extremely acute sense of touch, and that the deaf stand out, of their strong, stand out for their strongly developed sight. Blindness and deafness have been understood in narrowly organic terms. The pedagogical approach to such children has also been from the point of view of biological compensation. For example, if we take out one kidney, then the other takes over the former's function. In other words, the question of defects has always been posed in crude physical terms. Our whole system of special education has been from the perspective, or from this perspective, therapeutic or medicinal pedagogy. Moreover, it is clear to every educator that a blind or deaf mute child is first of all a child and on a second level, as the German psychologists say, a special child, a blind child or a deaf mute child. If in good conscience you accept the recently conducted psychological analysis of experience connected with blindness and deafness, I refer to the most fundamental work in the area of the psychology of the blind, the work published by Brooklyn this year. You will be able to see how the psychological makeup of a blind person arises not primarily from the physical handicap itself, but secondarily as a result of those social consequences caused by the defect. Our task consists of seeing to it that medicinal therapeutic pedagogy does not deprive a child of normal nourishment, because the doctor is wrong who, 
when prescribing medicine for an ill person, forgets that the sick must also eat normally and that it is po impossible to live by medicine alone. Such pedagogy produces an education which from the outset focuses on disability as a principle. As a result, we have something radically different from the fundamentals of social education. The place of special education in the general educational system is extremely easy and simple to determine if we proceed from its position in relation to education as a whole. In the final analysis, any educational process may, as the physiologists now put it, be reduced to the creation of certain new forms of behavior, to the formation of conditional reactions or conditional reflexes. However, from a physiological point of view, a, pos a position more dangerous for us in this respect, the education of, the, of a defective child does not differ in principle from the education of a normal child. Blindness and deafness physiologically means simply the absence of one of the sensory organs, as we used to say, or one of the analyzers, as the physiologists now say. This means that under the condition in which one of the paths of contact with the outside world is absent, it may, to a large measure, be compensated for by other paths. The view of external experimental physiology, which is a very important view for pedagogy, holds that conditional forms of behavior are in principle connected by the same path with the various sensory organs or various analyzers. A conditional reflex may be induced from the eye just as well from the ear, from the ear just as from the skin, and consequently, when, the edu when in the educational process, we exchange one analyzer for another, one channel for another, we have embarked on the path of social compensation for a given defect. After all, it is not important that the blind should see letters. It is important that they should know how to read and to read in the same way that you and I read, and that they learn to do this just as normal children do. It is important that a blind person write and not just move his pen around the paper. If he learns to write by perforating paper with a pen, we again have the same principle and practically an identical phenomenon. Therefore, the formula by Kurtman, who agrees that it is impossible to measure the blind, the deaf mute, and the mentally handicapped by the same standard as the normal child must be reversed. One should and must approach a blind and a deaf mute child psychologically and pedagogically with the same standard used for a normal child. Essentially, there is no difference either in the educational approach to a handicapped child and to a normal one, or in the psychological organization of their personalities. P. Ya Troshin's book, published in 1915, now famous in our country, includes this extremely important idea. It is an error to see only illness and abnormality. In an abnormal child, we perceive only the defect, and therefore, our teachings about these children and our approaches to them are limited to ascertaining the percentages of their blindness, deafness, or distortion of taste. We dwell on the nuggets of illness and not on the mountains of health. We notice only defects which are minuscule in comparison with colossal areas of wealth which handicapped children possess. These absurd truisms, which it would seem are difficult to dispute, radically conflict with what we have to see in theory and practice about special education. I have in mind, I have in my hand a booklet published in Switzerland this year. In it, we read some notions which to our educators sound like a great and important discovery. It is necessary to relate to a blind child just as one would to a seeing child, that is to teach him to walk at the same time as a seeing child learns to walk, and to give him as much opportunity as possible to play with all children. In Switzerland, these notions are considered absurdities, while in our country we believe the opposite to be true. It seems to me that there are two directions in special education implied here, orientation toward illness, orientation toward health. Both the, statistic, both the statistics of our practical experience and the data from our scientific theory force us to recognize the first as a false direction for our special education. I could cite some data in this field, but will limit myself to a reference to the accounts of the last Congress in Stuttgart which took place this year, and questions of the education and well-being of the blind. 
Here, the German and the American systems came into conflict. The educational system of the former is oriented towards the shortcomings of a blind child, the other toward the child's remaining, remaining reserve of health. Although the collision of the two systems occurred in Germany, it turned out to be a shattering experience for the Germans. The German position proved to have no justification in life. I allow myself to illustrate one point of special education upon which I am advancing as the main thesis. It can be formulated as follows. Any question of special education is at the same time a question of special education in its entirety. For the deaf, only the organ for hearing is affected. All remaining organs are healthy. Because of his hearing impairment, the deaf child cannot learn human speech. It is possible to teach the deaf child oral speech by means of lip reading, by connecting the different representations of lip movement which accompany speech. In other words, it is possible to teach a child to hear with his eyes. In this way, we can successfully teach the deaf to speak not only one specific language, but several languages with the help of kinesthetic motor sensations evoked during articulation. This method of instruction, the German method, has all the advantages over other methods, such as the methods of mimicry, the French method, or the method of manual alphabet, dactylology, writing in the air. Because such speech makes communication possible between the deaf and the hearing and serves as a tool for developing thought and consciousness, for us, there was no doubt about the fact that it is precisely oral speech, the oral method, which must be placed at the head of the agenda in education for the deaf mute. However, as soon as you turn to practice, you will immediately see that this particular question is a question of social education as a whole. In practice, it turns out that instruction in oral speech has produced exceedingly deplorable results. This instruction takes up so much time and it usually does not teach one to build phrases logically, but produces pronunciation in place of speech. It limits vocabulary. Thus, this approach causes an extremely difficult and confused situation, which theoretically is favorably resolved by one method, but in practice produces the opposite results. In German schools where this method of teaching the deaf mute oral speech is used, the greatest distortions of scientific pedagogy can be observed. Because of the exceptional cruelty and coercion applied to the child, he successfully learns oral speech, but his personal interest is lost along the way. Mimicry is forbidden in these schools and it is cause for punishment. Nevertheless, educators have not found the means to eliminate mimicry. The famous school for the deaf named after J. Vatter is renowned for its outstanding successes in this respect, but the lessons in oral speech are conducted with enormous cruelty. When forcing a pupil to master a difficult sound, the teacher could knock out his tooth and, having wiped the blood from his hand, he would proceed to the next sound. This practical side of life is at odds with the method itself. The pedagogues assert that oral speech is unnatural for the deaf mute, that this method is unnatural since it contradicts the child's nature. In this case, we are convinced that neither the French, the German, the Italian, nor a combined method can offer a way out of this dilemma, that only the socialization of education can offer the solution. If a child has a need for oral speech, if the need for mimicry is eliminated, only then can we be assured that oral speech will develop. I am forced to address the specialists, and they find that the oral method is better verified by life. Within a few years after completion of school, when the students gather together, it turns out that if oral speech was the condition for the children's existence, then they mastered this speech completely. If they had no need for oral speech, then they returned to the muteness with which they first entered school. In our schools for the deaf mute, everything conflicts with the children's real interests. All their instincts and drives become not our allies in the cause of education, but our enemies. We have produced a special method, which in advance is at odds with the child. Before beginning, we want to break the child in order to engraft speech onto his muteness. 
and in practice this forced method turns out to be unacceptable. By its very nature, it dooms speech to atrophy. From this, I will not draw the conclusion that oral speech is unsuitable for our schools. I want only to say that not a single issue of special education can be addressed solely within the narrow framework of special education. The question of instruction in oral speech is not a question of methods of articulation. We must approach it from a different, unexpected angle. If we seek to teach the deaf mute to work, but if he learns to make a black rag dolls to sell and to make surprises and carry them around to restaurants, offering them to the guests, this is not vocational education, but training to be beggars who find it more convenient to beg for alms with something in their hands. In such a situation, it might be more, more advantageous for a deaf person than for a speaking person because people will buy more readily from the former. If, however, life demanded oral speech as an inescapable necessity, and if in general the question of vocational training were posed in normal terms, then one could be assured that the acquisition of oral speech in the schools for the deaf mute would not pose such a problem. Any method may be carried to an absurdity. This has happened with the oral method in our schools. This question can be correctly resolved only if we pose it in all its breadth as a question of social education as a whole. This is why it seems to me that all our work should be re-examined from beginning to end. The question of vocational education for the blind compels us to come to the same conclusions. Labor is presented to children in an artificially prepared form, while the organization and collective components of labor have been excluded. These components are taken on by the seeing for themselves and the blind person is left to work in isolation. What results can be expected when the pupil is only a laborer on whose behalf someone else carries out the organizational work and who, not being accustomed to cooperation with others at work, turns into an invalid upon or an invalid upon graduation from school. If our school introduced the blind child to industrial and professional labor, which included the social and organizational elements, the most valuable educational elements resulting from vocational training for the blind might be totally different. Therefore, it seems to me that maximum orientation toward normal child activity must serve as the point of departure for our re-examination of special education. The entire problem is extremely simple and clear. No one would think of denying the need for special education. It is impossible to say that no special skills are needed by the blind by the deaf and the mentally handicapped, but these special skills and training must be subordinated to general education, to general training. Special education must merge with the overall child activity. Three, at some point there had to have been a two, but I did not see it and did not say it. So three, let us turn to mentally handicapped children. Even here, the basic problem is the same the fusion of special and general education. Here it seems the air is a bit fresher and new ideas from the public school have already penetrated this area. But even here, the basic problem has remained unsolved up until now. And in this case, the puny calves of special education push out the fatted calves of mainstream education. In order to illustrate, I will dwell on how A.N. Grabarov resolved this question in his book, The Auxiliary School published in 1925, the best book we have at our disposal in this area. I will say in advance that here the qu this question has been decided basically in the old way, to the advantage of the, of the fat calves. The author is completely right when he says that methods developed from practical experiences of educating mentally handicapped children have significance not only for the auxiliary school, but also for the regular public school. It is so much more important to be able to clearly and distinctly define the fundamental positions of auxiliary education. It is even more important for special education to understand definitively certain fundamental laws of general education. Unfortunately, neither foreign nor Russian literature clearly defines either. Scientific thought has still not penetrated the barrier between the theory of normal child development and the theory of abnormal development. 
until this is accomplished, until accounts have been completely squared off between abnormal pedagogy and general pedagogy, both will remain incomplete and defectology will inevitably be without principles. This could not have been more clearly stated in Grabarov's book. The book is a breath of fresh air without any doubt and the author wants to keep abreast of the new approach to education. He wants to, but he is not able to. These are only a few minor points, which when carefully reviewed turned out to be not simply details, but indications of the groundlessness which we have just mentioned. In actual studies of abnormal development and its various forms, physical abnormality has been distinguished from psychological abnormality. In the second category, we find mentally handicapped children, but are they physically healthy, as well as children with partial failure in only the emotional and volitional sphere. In this case, you almost always find deficient development, development of the intellect, according to Grabarov. Here you have a model of the vague manner in which the question of moral deficiency has been conceptualized. Precisely in these few lines, mentioned in passing, we find pedagogical negligence, carelessness, inconsistency, and weakness. We also find the weak psychological hypothesis that insufficient mental development causes problems in the emotional volitional sphere. In any discussion or effort to arrive at a decision, the struggle among motives is usually insignificant. Motives of a moralistic or lawful nature are usually ignored by the subject and egotistical tendencies tend, tend to prevail. Again, that was according to this fellow that he's talking about. How simple it all is. The trouble is not that the author expresses himself at times with vagueness and confusion. The trouble is rather that we have no clear-cut conception of child defectology, and it is impossible to build any pedagogical theory on such fogginess. Whenever there is a prevalence of egotistical motives, any approach to child education becomes impossible. After this, we are not surprised by the author's following assertion. A defective child in the classroom means the breeding ground for contagion within the school. It comes as no surprise that the German system is partial to an isolated educational system in which the auxiliary school makes no attempt to return to the normal mainstream school within a certain time period the children entrusted to them. The fundamental understanding of child defectology as it is practiced according to English law and American juridical practice with all types of organic idiosyncrasies is suddenly transformed in a new pedagogical theory. The pedagogical side of the matter is therefore over overflowing with judgmental errors. No, the judgments taken separately are approximately true. That is to say they are sometimes true, but at the same time not true. Because the theory as a whole is full of that fundamental groundlessness which has characterized psychological theory. Third, the author says that during schooling we must implant in him, the child, firmly established habits of social behavior. And finally, fourth, it is necessary to adequately orient the child to his surrounding world. The above named necessities come third and fourth. Well, what comes first and second? Enculturation of the senses and psychological medical support. Here again, we have not details, but the cornerstone. If enculturation of the senses and psychological support are of primary importance and social habits and orientation to the surrounding world are third and fourth, we have not traveled a single step from the classical system of therapeutic pedagogy with its nursing home atmosphere, with its zealous attention to microscopic illnesses, with its naive confidence that the psychological makeup may be developed, developed, cured, brought into harmony, and so forth. By therapeutic measures without regard for the general development of habits of social behavior, inasmuch as our system re resolves the main issue of any educational program in defectology, namely the interaction between general and special education, it is reflected in a basic view of the problem. Must we medically treat the defect in a handicapped child concentrating three-fourths of his education 
on the correction of this defect? Or must we develop the enormous deposits in deep layers of psychological health within the child? All work is of a compensatory corrective nature, says the author. And with that statement, the core of his system is revealed. Other approaches, such as the biogenetic point of view, the discipline of the natural causes, concur totally with this statement. And the same could be said of the vague phraseology which accompanies attempts to define the final goal for vocational education as harmonious development and so forth. One asks oneself, are these details which the editor inadvertently left in, or are they essentially elements of a theory doomed to scientific and pedagogical groundlessness, inasmuch as they represent a system of education without a precise point of departure? For a resolution, one turns, of course, not to comments made in passing, but to those chapters which elaborate on the question, where there is to be found a system of exercises in psychological orth orthopedy, a psychological support system, with its classic lessons in silence, and along the same lines, Egyptian labor for children, senseless, burdensome, synthetic, and futile. I have selected a few items as examples. Exercise number one. <clears throat> On the count of one, two, three, complete silence is to be established. The end of the exercise is signaled by the teacher's rap on the table. Repeat, repeat three or four times, hold to the count of 10, then 15, 20, 30 seconds. The pupil who does not hold out, who turns around, begins to talk, etc., has to continue on an individual basis or in groups of two to three people. The class follows. Exercise number two. On command, silence is established. The teacher gives one of the pupils a task which must be executed as quietly as possible. After each exercise is completed, a 20 to 30 second rest follows, then discussion. The number of exercises equals the number of pupils in the class. Examples. One, Misha going up to the board takes chalk and puts it on the table. Then he is to take a seat quietly and so forth. Quiet. And so on and so on. In another exercise, hold the position you have assumed as long as possible. Give each child a thin book with a hard cover or a small board of an appropriate size, which must be held horizontally. On this plane, he must hold a piece of chalk, or even better, a small stick whittled out of wood about 10 to 12 centimeters in length and about 1 to 1.5 centimeters in diameter. The slightest movement will topple this stick over. In the first position, a child stands with his heels together, toes apart, and holds the small board in both hands. Another pupil sets the stick on it. Exercise number four. The same exercises, only without spreading the feet, toes together. One can say without a vestige of polemical fervor or exaggeration, that the senselessness of these exercises is striking and by far exceeds the nonsense of the old German book of translations, although they are both in the same category. Do you play the violin? No, my little friend, but this man's aunt is going abroad. The exact same senselessness. Moreover, all the exercises in psychological support and the cultivation of the senses constitute similar nonsense. One must learn to finish as quickly as possible the tasks of carrying a dish full of water, threading beads, throwing rings, unstringing beads, tracing letters, comparing tables, striking an expressive pose, steadying smells, comparing the strength of smells. Who can be reared from all of this? Does this not sooner transform a normal child into a mentally handicapped child rather than develop in the handicapped child those mechanisms of behavior, psychology, and personality which have not yet meshed with the sharp teeth of life's intricate gears? How does this all differ from the sharp teeth of the little mice of our neighbor in the French primer? If you bear in mind that each exercise is repeated frequently in the course of a series of lessons, and that precisely these exercises constitute the first and second place among the school's priorities, then it becomes clear that until we dispense with pre-scientific pedagogy and turn the auxiliary school 180 degrees on its axis, we will develop nothing with our conical 
on a thin board and will achieve nothing in our attempt to educate the handicapped child, but instead only force him into greater handicappedness. This is not the place for a full development of all positive possibilities for exercises and psychological support and sensory motor control at play, at work activity, and in a child's social conduct. However, one cannot help but mention that these same lessons in silence, if conducted without commands and with meaning, regulated by real need and by the mechanism of play, would suddenly lose the character of Egyptian torture and would serve as an excellent educational means. The argument is not whether or not to teach a child to observe silence, but which means to employ to this end. Do we need lessons in obedience upon command or lessons in purposeful, meaningful silence? This frequently cited example illustrates the overall description of the difference between the, the two different systems, the old therapeutic system and the new social pedagogy. And what does segregation of the sexes mean in the education of mentally handicapped children other than a harsh, a harsh retreat into the recesses of the old theory and digression into its isolated positions. It is embarrassing to repeat these absurd truths about the pointless separation of the sexes and about the direct benefit of acquainting boys and girls with each other, as if these truths apply tenfold to a handicapped child. Where, if not in school, will a handicapped boy have real human contact with girls? Eh. What will seclusion in his already extremely barren and meager life do for him besides intensify his instinctual drives? And all the wise reasoning about the appropriate exercise of satisfaction will not save the theory at its most vulnerable point. You cannot give a child candy and then use it as an incentive to do something right. The reverse should be true. Suffering precedes pleasure. As a result, the candy comes afterward, and that's all there is to it. No, it is impossible to construct a theory and system of education on good intentions alone just as it is impossible to build a house on sand. If we begin to say as well that the goal of education is to create a harmonious education, and by harmony we mean the manifestation of a creative individuality, etc., we will create nothing. The new pedagogy for the handicapped child demands, first of all, a courageous and decisive rejection of the outdated as old as Adam systems, with lessons in silence, beads, orthopedy, and cultivation of the senses, and second of all, a disciplined, sober, and conscientious assessment of the real goals of social education for such a child. These are the necessary and un unav unavoidable prerequisites for the long overdue and slow in coming revolutionary reform of the education for handicapped children. For all their freshness, such books as that by A.N. Grabarov have come only halfway. From these examples, it is clearly seen that the special problems, such as teaching speech to deaf mute children, training blind children in vocations, establishing sensory motor control among the mentally handicapped, and indeed all questions of special education can be answered only on the basis of social education as a whole. It is impossible to decide them in isolation. Four. It appears to me that the development of our school represents an extremely outdated form of education in comparison with the practice of the West Europeans and the Americans. We are a good 10 years behind in comparison with the techniques and devices of the West European schools, and it would seem to us that it is necessary to be on an equal footing with them. But there are two answers to the question of what constitutes success in Europe and America. On the other hand, this success includes features which we need to cultivate in our schools. And on the other hand, these steps were taken in precisely a direction which we must categorically reject. For example, the achievements by the Germans in the area of work with the blind have caused quite a sensation around the world. I dwell on this aspect because it is elucidated in S.S. Golovin's book. The work is connected with the name of P. Pearls, and the results can be formulated in one phrase. The introduction of the blind into heavy industry on the basis of real, very success successful experience. For the first time in the history of mankind, the blind have begun to work with complex machinery, and this experiment has proved very fruitful. 
the Berlin Commission on the Investigation of Professions Suitable for the Blind recognized 122 professions beyond the, the beyond of the, that narrow circle of professions set aside for the blind, blind musicians, choristers, craftsmen, and the helpless, the greater part of which are connected with jobs in heavy industry. In other words, the highest form of labor, polytechnical skills, and social organizational experience turned out to be absolutely suitable for the blind. Nothing needs to be said about the colossal value such a statement has for pedagogy. It is tantamount to the notion that it is possible to overcome this handicap by granting the blind full entry into the labor force. One must take into consideration that this experiment involved those who became blind during the war and that we may, may expect to encounter some difficulties when we turn to those who were born blind. Yet there is no doubt that theoretically and practically this experience, on the whole, can be applied to those born blind. Let us note two important principles which serve as the basis of assumption for this work. The first is that the blind will work side by side with the seeing. In no job will the blind work by themselves, alone in isolation. They will definitely work together in cooperation with the seeing. Such a system of cooperation has been worked out so that it is easier to apply it to the blind. The second principle is that the blind are not to specialize in one machine or job alone. For pedagogical reasons, they are to transfer from one division of machinery to the other, or to another. They are to switch from one machine to another because general polytechnical fundamentals are needed for participation in production as a conscientious worker. I will not begin to cite passages. I suggest, however, reading those sections from Golovin's work, where he, he oops, where he lit, oh shit, where he lists the machines on which the blind are to work: presses, punching presses, cutting machines, threading machines, drills, electric lathes, and so forth. Hence, the labor of the blind turns out to be fully suitable for heavy industry. This is the healthy and positive side of European and American special pedagogy to which I have already referred. This aspect we must adopt for our special schools. But I must say that in all countries up until now, these accomplishments have been directed along a course which is at its very core profoundly alien to us. You know how sharply our social education differs from that of the Americans and the Germans. According to our general direction, the use of new pedagogical technology must proceed along a completely different path. It should be swung around 100, 180 degrees. I shall not begin now to comment concretely about how this path will be realized, because I would have to repeat the truisms of overall social pedagogy, on the basis of which our system of social education is constructed and contained. I allow myself simply to make the following points. There is only one essential guiding principle for overcoming and compensating for the various defects. Pedagogy must orient itself to a lesser degree toward deficiency and illness and to a greater degree toward the norm and the child's overall health. What constitutes our radical divergence from the West with respect to this question? Only the fact that there, it is, that there is a question of social welfare, whereas for us it is a... Hold on. What constitutes our radical divergence from the West with respect to this question? Only the fact that there it is a question of social wel welfare, whereas for us it is a question of social education. There it is a question of charity for invalids and social insurance against crime and begging. It is extremely difficult to get rid of the philanthropic inv invalid-oriented point of view. We often hear assertions that biogenetic cases are of interest not as much for special education as for social disdain. The way the question was posed amounts to a radical untruth. The question of educating handicapped children has until now been kept in the background, mainly because more pressing questions demanded our attention during the first years of the revolution. Now the time has come to bring the question before wide public attention.